Someone turns 65 every eight seconds in this country, and as our elderly population grows, so does our need to build an economy around our future selves. In this episode, three leaders in the age justice movement share their ideas about how we can age with dignity and power and change our society to reflect just that. Then we visit the largest home care cooperative in the U.S. to take a look at age justice and worker justice in practice. It's all coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. are not getting any younger. In fact, the American population is getting older by the day, working, traveling, and living longer. That's us, people. Baby boomers are the fastest growing age group in the country. By year 2029, the national population of those age 65 and over will be 20% of the country. While in Silicon Valley, some people with power and money are preoccupied with living forever. For the rest of us, care is, with any luck, in our future. Now, we've talked with care workers in the past on this program about their drive for justice on the job. But what about the other piece of the equation, those who need care, the rest of us? What would an age justice platform look like for a politician, say, so that elders could age with dignity even if they weren't tech billionaires? Today's guests have some ideas. Alice Fisher is founder and director of the Radical Age Movement. Penny Cook is president and CEO of the Pioneer Network, and Rachel McCullough is campaign director of the New York Caring Majority. Welcome to the program. All right, so we'll start with um, unpacking your organizations a little bit. Um, Let's start with yours, Pioneer Network, what do you do? So Pioneer Network has been a nonprofit. We've been around for 22 years now, really to change the culture of aging by looking at the culture of long-term care and really trying to change the culture of assisted living communities and nursing homes to make sure that elders are respected and that they do receive the type of care and the type of quality of life that they want and deserve. And Rachel, caring? The New York Caring Majority is a coalition in New York State of home care workers and domestic workers, the caregivers you mentioned, but also elders or seniors people with disabilities, and the massive population of unpaid family caregivers, especially women, um, all of whom are joining forces to fight for a caring economy that works for all of us. All right, and finally, Radical Aging. Radical Age Movement is a new not-for-profit. We're only, uh, well, we're almost four years old. And um, our premise is that all of the ills that older people are dealing with, all of the issues stem from one thing, and that one thing is age prejudice. Now, I want you to unpack that a little bit more, and then I want you to tell me what's radical about radical age. Okay, because people do not see older people as part of everybody, they're kind of like the other. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not me. Those are old people. Older people don't get the fair allocation of any resources. They have to fight for every dime. In New York City, people over 65 are just about 20% of the population. We get less than one half of 1% of the budget goes to senior services, total senior services. Mm. And every year we have to fight for that half of 1%. And the radical bit? And the radical part is that the people that came together to do this, when we were deciding on a name, most of us were radicals from the (laughs) 60s. And radical age movement came up and everybody was like, that's it, that's it, that's it. Because I don't think that a lot of this would have um, been so uh, prominent in the news and everything if it wasn't for the fact that we we are, as a group of people, loud, boisterous, always demanded what we felt we needed, and now it was our turn. And I was in a group of people. I said, well, if you don't like what's going on with your parents, guess what? 
you're next. Yeah. And so even though people will say all the time, oh, I never want to get old, that's not going to happen. That's what my 99-year-old grandmother said. Right. It's not going to happen. <laughs> she would also refer to the old people in line in this right, grocery store. Right, right, right. Um, we're talking about old people, about age as a homogeneous thing, which it is so not. Not. Um, Rachel, <laughs> can we just address that for a minute? I mean, we're talking about people in cities, people in rural areas. We're talking about queer aging people. We're talking about people with disabilities, disabled people. I mean, it's a huge gamut. How can one approach work for such a diverse group? Age justice, like all forms of justice, as you're referencing, can only be approached from an intersectional framework um, by talking about the ways in which age or aging intersects, of course, very directly with disability and with disability justice and disability mm -hmm. rights movements, but also with economic justice, with racial justice, with feminism, with environmental justice, with every other freedom struggle of our day today and of the last many centuries. And when I think about what we're called on to do right now, it is to build coalitions and to build partnerships that are intergenerational or multi-generational, multiracial, cross-class, usually led by women, um, but that create the opportunity for seniors or elders or older folks as well as disabled people to be at the center and to be the protagonists of, of the struggle because our movements so often um, have struggled to actually prioritize access and accessibility combined with the stigma that Alice is referring to. Um, we find ourselves, even within some of our social movements, reproducing some of the very same dynamics of disposability that you see in the wider society mm. in relation to older folks. Hey, Penny, anything you'd add to that? You know, I think it's so important that when we're talking about ageism, we also do talk about the intersection of ableism. And I think that ageism and ableism go hand in hand, that prejudice against people when they have some sort of disability, whether it be cognitive and physical. And obviously we know as people get older, they, there's more propensity to have some sort of disability. And so just as the idea that when we're not able, we're sort of diminished in our society, I think that is even exemplified more as we get older. And so that's a huge issue. I mean, you've all touched on it, but I just want to underscore, you just talked about able, the word able, which I think in our economy means able to produce something. Um, labor, products, children, kind of. Are we really talking about our society's relationship to productivity and, 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 and profit? In a way, we are. How so? Because that is the underpinning of everything. Old people are looked at as we do not contribute to society. We just take, which, of course, is not true. But that is the perceived image. Aging isn't a problem. Ageism is the problem. Yeah. It's the way that other people perceive us and assign descriptors to us. Because there are cultures that do this differently. And we're not just talking, you know, Bali or someplace. I mean, Western Europe does some of these things a little bit differently, doesn't it? Who wants to address models that are useful for us? Well, I think that one of the, the things that we always look at is what is going on in other countries. And you're right that in other countries, when we're talking especially about care and support, as, as people are growing older, those, those um, services are provided to people. And it's not that it's an extra service. This is a service that is part of life. You know, from, from birth to death, there are services in place in Europe for people to have that care and support. And that's something that in our country, I think when you reach a certain age, you're right, Alice, that, I mean, it's looked at as taking that, you know, we have to give elders these services that they're just not entitled to them because they're aging and growing older. Is so. there any chance that with demographic shifts we could shift some of this in the sense that Native American communities do it differently, immigrant populations often do it differently, and the black community that's a little bit more respect for elders? Yeah. Maybe it's a race problem? Well, <laughs> good question. So many things we come down to them. white people screwing it up. Um, I, I think for us, the reason we call ourselves the caring majority is essentially resting on this assumption or this logic. It's the recognition that um, if indeed this has been a, um, a problem, a systemic problem for a very, very long time in the United States, we have um, 
we've turned some we've turned a corner with the um, beginning of the elder boom, which began. I mean, a statistical corner. Yeah, statistic. We've turned a statistical corner. Um, Alice, you mentioned ten thousand a day. Ten thousand people a day turn sixty-five. That's yeah, right. and that, so that's the, at the rate of one every eight seconds. Meanwhile, the direct care and home care sector is the fastest growing occupational sector in our economy where workers continue to not make living wages. And then it's women more broadly at every level of our economy who are picking up the pieces and making ends meet. We call ourselves a majority because if we can manage to build a movement that combines that mas massive population of seniors with that fast growing workforce with virtually every woman in the United States who is providing some form of uncompensated care for children or for elders, we would have unstoppable power to transform our economy on every level. We see this as actually a really, really powerful strategy for bringing about some of the transitions in our economy that we need to see. And I think you mentioned this, but women also live longer and they're not just doing right. the caring, but they're living the longer. Um, what's your vision of how we would do this right? You talked about how we would mobilize right, but what's your vision of what an age justice society would look like? At the federal level, uh, starting at that starting at that place, um, it's many of the ideas that are already starting to percolate in this political moment. It's Medicare for all, but a Medicare for all that includes this sector, the, what we call long-term care, or long-term services and supports. This is the the services and supports that are designed for seniors and people with disabilities to be able to access all kinds of care and support, usually in the home. And 90% of us would prefer to receive those services in our home rather than in an institution. And you're saying that's currently in the conversation about Medicare for all? So single payer? Very, a very big win that we've had recently um, that actually began in New York um, after many, many years of seniors, people with disabilities, folks in the caring majority pushing for single payer to include long-term care. We finally just got it included both in the New York State Health Act, the New York Health Act, which is New York single payer bill, and Bernie Sanders and Pramila Jayapal have now included it in Medicare for all at a federal level. So there, there's finally something beginning to shift in the conversation and a level of inclusion of, of our communities and of our sector that also would mean that Medicare for all would be a truly, essentially like a feminist New Deal, a New Deal that would actually transform the ways in which care and care work is understood and valued in our economy. So Medicare for all, and I think by extension, things like a feminist new deal or essentially a green new deal that recognizes that care work and care jobs are green jobs, mm -hmm. um, are jobs that can never be automated, that can never be outsourced, and that a sustainable economy or a caring economy is one in which we bring care and caregiving from the margins to the center. We need platforms that have that understanding at every level, both from the social safety net to the jobs dimension. Anything you'd add to that picture? Two Alice? things I would add to that is, um, just a few weeks ago, I testified at City Hall on, uh, the topic was women aging into poverty. Mm. Mm. And there's a lot of causes. We do live longer. One of the major causes is caregiving. Women leave their careers or their jobs to care for their elderly parents, thinking that when they're done, they will go back to their careers. And when they try to go back, guess what? They're too old. Nobody wants them in the workforce. That alone, that one statistic alone, shows how awful it will be if we cut Medicare, we cut Medicaid, we cut Social Security, and now we don't even allow these people to the workforce. The other thing I would like to add is that a really huge reason that's driving all of this is longevity. Mm -hmm. And that was how I started to get interested in this. It's like, what effect does longevity have on our society? Well, it's enormous. Every demographic has changed. 65 years old today is not 65 years old in your mother's generation, and certainly not your grandmother's generation. And yet, everybody from 65 to 105 is lumped into 
the same category. So you're thinking our retirement policy is a problem too? Oh, everything. Everything. Pardon? What is retirement? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we would never lump 25-year-olds. Right. We would never lump 20-year-olds with 45-year-olds. And that's what you're talking yeah. about. We're lumping 65-year-olds with 80-year-olds, 90-year-olds, 100-year-olds. And I think when we're talking about populations, we have to look at individuals. Right. And we can look at certain cohorts, for instance, or we can look at where people are in their life experience. But I don't think we can lump t people together now because of their age. We still have so many programs where eligibility is over 55, over 60, over 65. Right. Well, what is right for a 65-year-old person is not right for a hundred year old person and really we should just be looking at the person and not about age. Right. But let's go back to policy for a second. Am I hearing lift the cap on social security payment? I mean what are oh. some of the practical things we could do here? If we're thinking of helping a politician to create a platform that would show their commitment to age justice, what would they have on it? Well I think the first thing is including long-term services and supports into any platform and that's been an issue that is is um, is ready to be part of the conversation and I think with Medicare for All we're finally hearing about that because when we talk about the services and the care and support that people want and need as they're growing older it's a lot of these things that are included in long-term services and supports that people just don't have access to so I think that's one of the first issues in any policy discussion. Alice? Everybody knows when you fill out a form they want to know your age for some demographic study or how they're going to sell you a product. Mostly. And you know, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, and then it goes 65 and up. It's like at 65 the world <laughs> ends. Well now, 65 and up means an, could mean another 40 years. Yeah. Easily. Every day I get notices about famous people turning 100. It's not an anomaly anymore. And so all of this has come together and created this need and made it public and made it viewable. More people in this country, the number one cause of bankruptcy right. is health care, is paying for health care. That's really sad. If we get this right, what's the story we tell the future? Our nation, our society, was faced with what many called a crisis. They were using a lot of really catastrophic language to talk about it, the, the age wave oh, and yeah, the, the silver tsunami, tsunami <laughs> right? As if it was part and parcel right. somehow of climate change, right? right. That if we're all gonna be underwater right. and these takers, right? right. These right. takers are just going to suck us dry. All right. of our mm -hmm. benefits, all of our wealth as a nation is going to get sucked dry. But a movement came together and it was a movement of people across the lifespan, right. across geography, across class, across race, led by women, who recognize that actually this elder boom that we are experiencing right now, um, the, the corporations and politicians might be describing it as a crisis, but it is in fact an unprecedented blessing. And if we, and we, uh, sorry, we're talking in the past That's tense, right. and so we, figured out how to transform this demographic shift into the unprecedented window of opportunity. And we transformed our economy and our society and our democracy on every level. I like and it. We now live in cities that are designed truly for all of us and not just for able-bodied 20-somethings. And as a result, all of us have the dignity that we need. Wonderful. Thank you all for coming in. What a pleasure to talk with you. Alice, Rachel, Penny. This is the Laura Flanders Show. I don't know about you, but I am feeling much better about my future, um, <laughs> even if I am around for another 40 years. Stay tuned for our report from the field as we take a look at some of the cultural change that is happening out there in real life right now. Ashton Applewhite's an activist and a writer who believes that ageism, like any other discrimination, must be ended to release us from the individual burdens of growing old. Here's Ashton. I call my book a manifesto because a manifesto is a call for radical social change. And we're not going to change attitudes towards age and aging in the society without a collective movement. 
Lots about getting older is hard. We all have our fears, whether of getting older or getting sick or ending up alone. And those fears are legitimate and real. But it never dawns on most of us that the culture in which we age can make those things easier or harder. And this society makes things much harder by placing the burden on the individual, even though an enormous, we're all hostage to this range of external forces over which we have little or no control. We think that if I have wrinkles, I can't get a date, you know, that's my problem. If I can't go up the stairs, I need to eat more spinach, whatever. We blame ourselves for aging. Instead of comparing notes, coming together, which we all need to do in order to learn about age bias, because then you see, oh, these are not personal problems. These are widely shared political problems, and they require collective political action, a radical aging movement to change the way we as individuals and as members of society see age and aging in a more realistic and a more nuanced and a positive manner that gets rid of the notion that age renders people less valuable, less important, less visible. It's not okay, it's gotta change. The Laura Flanders Show took a trip to the Bronx to learn how one home care agency is serving aging communities and the needs of those who work with them by providing quality care through quality jobs and a co-op. Here's that report. We do the hardest work, but we don't get paid for what we do. You know, it took a while for us to get at least $15 an hour when I feel that we deserve more because in reality, we're there more than the family, we're there more than the nurses. This is not for everybody. You know, a lot of us take the training, but we don't make it. You know, we go to a client's home, we see what it's all about, and it's like, oh no, this is not for me. You know, taking care of somebody that you don't even know that may even speak to you not correctly. You know, they, 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 they think that you're a maid, they think that you're there, they think that they're the one that pays you. You know, but we're there to promote independence because being a home health day, it's promoting um, independence for the ones that are still mobile. You know, because once we leave, who else is going to do it for you? So we're there to make sure that everything that you're supposed to do according to what the doctor says, according to what the nurse says, that you're, you know, that you're following through. So at the time that cooperative home care was started, the home care industry uh, was really not a good industry. It really was an industry that was sort of riddled with um, worker abuses, and we wanted to start cooperative home care um, to really demonstrate there was another way to create home care jobs and to train workers and invest in workers, and that if you built a quality job, the workers would then be able to really deliver quality care. We're not gonna talk about them with the same. You have that. And you now, you are the one who knows the heel. The heel, right here. There was a team at Community Service Society that um, worked in the Economic Development Department, and they were really charged with creating this, this organization that would invest in workers and really impact the economic development in the Bronx predominantly. So Cooperative Home Care Associates um, is a worker-owned cooperative which means that anyone who works for the cooperative can also be an owner, but you're not required to be an owner. After an individual has worked for cooperative home care for three months, they have an orientation, um, and then after the, an orientation to worker ownership, and after the orientation, they can make a decision about whether they're going to um, buy into the company. And if they opt to become a worker owner, the price of one share is $1,000. Um, Home care workers do not make a lot of money, so what ends up happening is that after they pay the initial $50, the cooperative lends them the remaining $950, and then that's incrementally paid back over a five-year period so that it's not um, cost prohibitive for the home care worker. When you are a worker owner, you have the right to run for the board. That is the single biggest factor in worker ownership and benefit because really home care workers are the ones who are the majority in the governance of this organization. And I see it a lot in worker owners. There's a sense of pride uh, in terms of the work that they're doing and wanting to see 
cooperative home care be successful. As the years went by and fighting, 1199 fighting and everybody fighting for our position, yeah, we have more respect now that they do respect us. You know, we're no longer as a home attendant, like they said. You know, we're there to make sure that you're, that um, we take care of you, that make sure that we keep you um, out of the um, emergency rooms, hospitals, because that's the reason why we're there, to avoid hospitalizations. I think everyone should be a worker's owner because it's a lot to go with the check. You know, it's, 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 it's a lot of perks. You know, you can actually say, I own one piece of cooperative home care. You know, because remember, home care, the pay is low. So any type of dividend or any type of extra money that you get, it's, it's a blessing. Being a worker-owned cooperative is one part of our model. Um, I think in general, having a culture around participatory management and an open door policy where we want workers to come in and express um, what's going on for them in their jobs, in their communities, is also part of this equation. And respecting and valuing the workforce and understanding that we need to invest in the workforce for them to have quality jobs so that they can go out and provide the kind of care that some of New York's most vulnerable populations need. Today in 2019, we have over 2,100 home care workers and cooperative home care is the largest uh, worker-owned cooperative in the United States.